Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this session on designing sustainable change. Uh, we're going to talk about the ideas initiative, give you a high-level overview of the design of that initiative, and uh, then we're going to have reports from three teams who've experienced uh, ideas, and they'll talk about their projects and the ways in which those projects have really focused on critical issues within and across uh, organizational boundaries. And uh, we are just so excited about this. Uh, it's been great. Yesterday we had the first Ideas alumni event. It's pretty tough to have an alumni when you're only, uh, what, 11 months old? But uh, we do have an alumni. And, uh, and there were 100 people in the room uh, excited about uh, sharing their experiences from the first three cohorts of Ideas. Um, the fourth and fifth cohorts have launched, and a sixth cohort um, uh, is up for selection shortly. So uh, we're, we're really fully engaged uh, with this, and, uh, and it's our opportunity now to continue to share the lessons learned from this and to give you a sense of uh, why this program is, ha was designed um, and how it's fitting into the reform initiatives uh, in the transform transformation agenda in Ontario these days. So um, I'm going to just start by introducing our panel so that um, there will be a smooth flow. Um, once I, I do the kind of brief introduction and overview that I'm going to create the sort of a context for these project presentations. And I'll, I'll go down the list here. So um, immediately on my left, your right, uh, is Amira Ginsberg. Dr. Ginsberg is a general internist and uh, Trillium Health Partners Medical Director of Quality and Performance. He's also the medical lead for health uh, system funding reform at the Mississauga ha Halton uh, Lynn an assistant professor at uh, the Institute for Health Policy Management Evaluation at the University of Toronto, and was honored in 2013, selected as one of nine key influencers of healthcare in Canada by the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. And on Amir's left, uh, Patty Cochran, um, also from, um, from Trillium Health Partners. Patty has over 30 years of administrative and nursing uh, experience and has played a strong leadership. <laughs> Sorry? A few years of... Uh, <laughs> she started very young, so... Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can remind me of that later, okay. Uh, and uh, is, um, now has a role as Senior Vice President, Clinical Strategy, and the Chief Innovation Officer at Trillium Health Partners. Um, then on, uh, moving down the line, uh, Clint Atendido, who's Director of Emergency Access and Flow from our second case study, which is the Markham Stouffville Hospital. Um, Clint received a ma ma Master's of Science in Nursing from McMaster and then an MN, MHSC degree uh, from the University of Toronto and is a certified health executive. Uh, next to Clint is Barbara Steed, who's the executive sponsor for the Markham Stouffville team. Um, Barb is a seasoned health leader, currently executive vice president of clinical programs, chief nurse executive um, at the hospital. Um, she is a registered nurse and holds a master's of health studies and is a certified health executive. Uh, then our third team um, from uh, Kitchener, uh, Jill Shitka is the Clinical Manager of Emergency and Acute Care at Grand River Hospital in Kitchener. She holds a baccalaureate from McMaster, a Master's in Leadership and Change from Guelph, and Lean Certification from the University of Michigan. This is a very well-educated group. And then uh, finally there, uh, Lynn Julius, Executive Director of Clinical Program Development at Grand River and she's a value-based leader. She's been a strong uh, component and instrumental in clinical system change, both in the hospital and the community. Um, so this is a team of people representing both the ideas teams, the projects teams, and the executive sponsors back at the hospitals in recognition of the fact that although you can give people excellent skills in an educational program, those skills are not valuable till they're back in the environment. And it's the, it's the relationship and the ongoing interchange between the team uh, and the executive sponsor in making change and understanding what the barriers are to, to making that change happen. So if you like this session, uh, please tweet it. If you don't, please tweet it as well. Um, so where are we? Um, this, this is not news, uh, but there are enormous pressures on healthcare. And there are pressures that come from a variety of different sources. They come from the changing nature of the epidemiology of healthcare need. 
They come from the mismatch between those needs and the current system. They come from the evolving technology, new medications, new instrumentation, new communication technologies that are changing our world um, every day and now have to be integrated into the way in which we provide care. So patients like Greg Price uh, get the right care at the right time in the right place with the connections between providers. Public expectations are increasing. We're bringing patients to the table and they're telling us what they like and what they don't like, which I think is very important. Uh, but we still have issues. We have issues about a workforce that's getting older uh, as the pace of work increases, which creates huge uh, frustrations and barriers on the issues of systems not being well designed to use the skills of people very well. Uh, professional autonomy still trumps over um, many other issues in our system in many different places. We still live with that. I mean, so we are in this perfect storm. I think we're fortunate to be in this country and to be in Ontario where we have strong leadership, we have a strong uh, healthcare system. We have the fundamentals right, now we have to make it work, right? So what's the difference between where we are right now and where we wanna be? How do we engage frontline providers to make a difference? How do we take that change and pull it across the system so it's not just isolated places, but you can get the right care everywhere in the right time? It's not an easy challenge. And the, the people who sit in the Ministry of Health who've created these bold plans and initiatives rely on the front lines of healthcare across the province to make that happen. And that's the, the genesis of, of the IDEAS uh, initiative. And it was, it was launched um, through the um, advocacy of several critical people, um, including Min, Min Alakan at the Ministry of Health, who said, we need a system to help engage and provide people with the tools to make a difference. And Min had been to Intermountain Healthcare, one of the high-performing healthcare systems that uh, we studied in a book um, uh, that we published six years ago. Uh, and she said it was a transformational experience to see the dialogue that happened between the physicians, the nurses, the other clinicians, and the managers who went through that program. And then they looked around the system that they were working in, and Dr. Brent James, the leader in Indian Mountain, who's been there for 20 years working on these issues, showed them what it's like to work in a system where people speak the same language, they use the same tools, and they're working on improving care across the system. So we said, we actually have better fundamentals in Ontario than they do in Utah in the American healthcare system, why should we be letting them outperform us? Let's create this kind of environment, this kind of tool to give people the skills to make a difference. So this is ideas. Um, um, and the program is providing a provincial initiative to really provide the resources, the skills linked to the critical issues, the critical problems that we face across the system. And we say um, there's four critical elements to this. Learn these skills, the knowledge that lies behind them. Actively practice that. So the IDEAS program is an active learning situation. It's learn the skill, do the skill, and then and implement that in a, in a project. Um, share the learning across the system and then sustain that moving forward. I'm just going to say a little bit about each one of these and then you'll hear the real meat of this um, in our, our three stories. So there are two um, uh, versions of ideas. The one we launched last year, which we call the Advanced Learning Program, a nine-day program where teams bring projects uh, and they work um, in a classroom setting with instructors and then their action periods between the classroom sessions um, three, uh, four two-day sessions and then a final day to present these projects supported by um, excellent coaches from Health Quality Ontario and data experts from ISIS who help people understand the data, use the data, identify what data is going to be useful for them. And then we brought in expert faculty from across the province, in fact, across North America using uh, the expertise that we had in our connections with Intermountain and with the University of Texas doing similar kinds of programs. This fall, we've launched the introductory two-day program, which is really designed for team members to be part of IDEAS, so that they have uh, understanding of the skills and the knowledge that's going to go into these projects um, across the province, and to give us a much larger group. So this is being done in collaboration with the faculties of medicine and associated health sciences in all the academic health science centers across Ontario, and it's been a great project working with these partners to figure out how we're going to integrate this program in, into their continuing professional development efforts. Um, 
as I said, uh, it's a team-based approach. Um, it, in it includes the applied learning and the in-class learning, and we're really trying to give people the critical skills. The technical skills, the technical quality skills of doing improvement, which are well-defined, but not well developed in Ontario. There are pockets where this happens, but there are a lot of people who still don't understand that. And just as important, and arguably more important, is the ability to work with teams and to focus on the adaptive problems. All quality improvement requires us to make change. How do we work with people who are perhaps skeptical or reluctant to make those changes? So giving people the adaptive leadership skills, the teamwork skills to work with them. And then to create this opportunity, to create this learning environment where people are able to work together to really share what they're doing. And we just had, as, as I said, this Ideas alumni event yesterday, and there was enormous energy in the room as people were coming together to talk about the experiences they had in their projects and discovering that many people in the different cohorts were working on similar projects. So we had five or six teams working on COPD, right? And the lessons they learn you know, are valuable across those teams and for other teams as well. Um, so this is a huge sort of uh, uh, opportunity, I think, to start to create a lot of learning um, across these teams and across the province as well. So in order to make this knowledge widely available, we've created what we call Share Ideas, an online pro project repository where the results of these projects are going to be there for people to see. So if you're working uh, on a discharge project in your organization and you want to know who else has been working on this in ideas, you can go in, add some keywords, and see what the results are. As I said, it's a partnership, um, IHPME at the University of Toronto, with Ontario universities across the province, ISIS providing uh, strong support around data, data analysis, uh, linking of data to quality improvement initiatives, and HQO, which is our health system uh, partner, really providing uh, a lead role in the coaching, the coordination of this activity, and trying to link ideas to many of the other projects that they're engaged in across the province. So our goals are to create a mass of people who are the champions of quality improvement and who have the skills to make a difference locally and to help to create energy across the province with a common language, common tools, common understanding of how to do this in different settings. And as you know, the problems are not just organizational problems, they're system problems. Um, and we need to provide people now with the skills across these different boundaries to be able to do this. So our panel today is going to really provide, I think, a detailed understanding of, of three of these initial 50 projects that we did in the, in the, in the first year, and an understanding of what the project is and how it's in, been integrated into a local environments. And I'll turn it over to Amir to start. Okay, good morning, um, and thanks for uh, inviting us to do some of this work. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak after the amazing morning session that we had and Ross's introduction. Uh, so I'm Amir Ginsberg. You heard in the, in the introductions, I'm from Trillium Health Partners. I'll probably call on Patty uh, when I get my three-minute warning, right, um, to come talk about the executive sponsor role. Uh, so the project that we were involved in for Ideas work was on the health links. So I get to participate in the East Mississauga Health Link. Uh, along with my ideas project partners, Anne McKay, Laura D'Souza, and Carla Rodriguez, some of whom are in the room, so uh, shout out to them. I get to be standing up here, but uh, it was a huge team effort to do some of this work. And of course, many other others, and I think I saw Joe somewhere, our HQO coach, so uh, thanks to Joe as well. So just by means of background, um, the East Mississauga Health Link was one of the 19 early adopter health links in the province, and it's a co-led organization by one of our family health teams in Mississauga and Trillium Health Partners as an acute care organization uh, kind of partnering in this work. Uh, we have a care coordinator role that's embedded in our Mississauga Halt and CCAC. Uh, we have referrals accepted from essentially all access points, hospital to home, uh, primary care, and from CCAC with some of their complex caseload. And the patients that the Health Link in our jurisdiction is serving are those with complex needs, so either medical or social complexity, uh, having multiple access points to the uh, basically high utilization services like the emergency department. Uh, or hospital, and they need care coordination to avert further, uh, you know, increased utilization and to improve their health outcomes. Uh, so that's kind of the background of the health link. 
And we thought, you know, we were challenged with doing things differently, right? That's the, the innovation of Health Links is to take cross-sectoral collaboration and really do things differently with a uh, challenging population to serve their care needs. And we thought, okay, we've got a budget, we've got some alignment in the system, we have a vision, we've got resources, there's incentives, uh, we have multiple project partners across the system. Uh, we're going to do something special here, and it's, it's maybe not so easy, but we're going to do it. And so we came up with this uh, aim within our uh, overall Health Things project for ideas we were going to coordinate the uh, care of complex patients and enhance it by having 80% of our patients attend an in-person care conference with their primary care providers uh, and the Health Think coordinator uh, within seven days of enrollment. And this would occur by the end of the fiscal year that we were operating in. And, you know, we actually dialed down uh, this aim. We thought we could do 100%. Right? So getting a patient, their primary care provider, and uh, a care coordinator from CCAC together in the same room to talk about the patient's self-articulated care goals, complete a coordinated care plan, uh, and set some, some, something different in the relationship and what, would, what was to follow. And we thought this would be easy. We actually thought, I remember in our session and ideas, we were thinking, yeah, we could do this 100% of the time. Uh, it's not even an aspirational goal. This is easy. We've got a we've got a budget that's been approved by the ministry. We've got uh, people really pushing towards getting these coordinated care plans done. This should be simple. It wasn't that simple. Uh, we had a lot of pro, uh, measures: uh, the number of care conferences, the time for uh, enrollment, uh, to, from enrollment to the care conference, how long did it take? A number of outcome measures that are a little bit more challenging to look at, and some balancing measures. Um, you know, at our alumni event yesterday, we heard about the importance of workload. So our balancing measure was how much extra work does this uh, does this put into the system? And so part of the idea's curriculum was to equip us with the quality improvement tools that we would need to do to understand what are change ideas, how do we know a change has happened, how are we going to measure, what do those measures need to look like. And so we had a bunch of things up here, and the purpose of this diagram is just to show you that we did stuff, not to read the fine print. But we, we actually did stuff, and, and look, we did some more stuff. Um, <laughs> So we had cause and effect diagrams, we had process maps, we developed care pathways. Uh, we had a lot of good tools to help us design our intervention and to monitor its success. So fast forward, here are some results. Um, this is not easy. Getting a patient, a care coordinator, and a family physician in the same room at the same time, uh, number one, is not easy. We were only successful in doing that for about half of our patients. And that seven-day target, what, while it sounds nice, and in the um, in the annual report that HQO has tabled in the legislature yesterday, and that we all received a copy today, it's hard to see your family doc in seven days within the system that we have. Uh, on average, in this high-needs population, complex care needs, with a big thrust in the system to make this happen, we were only successful 25% of the time within seven days. This is really hard to do. So, you know, keeping in, in Joshua's comments this morning, we felt like we failed, right? We didn't achieve our aim. Thanks, ideas, this was great. We, we came out for 10 days, over four months, and we actually did stuff, but it wasn't successful. But thank God they also taught us how to measure other things, because when we looked at the utilization of the emergency department within our health link, and this is only depicting those patients who were in the link for six months. So this is about 60 patients. So early signals. This may not be statistically significant, uh, but the uh, the utilization of eMERGE dropped by about an, uh, by about half. So overall, 30 percent, maybe 40 percent for the cohort. But those who actually had that care conference, they went down 50 percent. Those who uh, didn't have a care conference, uh, maybe 30 percent. So we think there's a there is a special sauce here. Uh, with getting people in the same room to talk about care goals and coordination of care. Some practical challenges, hard to do this work and bring the rigors of quality improvement uh, to a new initiative with multiple partners across the system. Uh, we spent about nine months just talking about this and ideas really was the thrust to go out and do because we felt we had the tools. Um, collecting high quality data in real time and acting on it, very difficult to do but mission critical to success in the improvement world. We had some strategic challenges. Uh, we had a very ambitious aim statement. We didn't think it was, but as we started to do this work, we said, holy cow, this, this stuff is really hard. How do we maintain momentum among the team when we really felt like, I don't know, we failed? Uh, maybe this result is chance. Well, we'll wait for the next quarter's results. 
or the next quarter. Uh, and, and you know, keeping momentum against that is very challenging. And of course, embedding sustainability across com- very complex partnerships in the system is, is very challenging. So maybe that's my segue. I'll pass it over to Patty to talk a little bit about the role of, ex- of executive sponsorship here. And we can take questions at the end of the panel. Thank you, Amir. You know, maybe to start is um, the issues and challenges in healthcare today probably pale in comparison with the challenges that we're going to face tomorrow. And I think most of us understand that. You all work in the industry. You know that capacity and demand are not going down. They're actually going up. And in our particular area with Trillium Health Partners, we've actually done some master planning and we're predicting that we need to double the size of our hospital beds by within the next 10 to 15 years. So, you know, we've got some capacity challenges. Um, so we need to start thinking differently and we, need to, we know that the solutions today are not going to be the solutions of tomorrow. I think what IDEAS has done is given us a bit of a framework to be able to think about how to solve some of those challenges and problems and with the tools and the processes and the expertise that we need in order to do it. And I think what's really brought that forward is the importance of who you get on the bus to do along that journey. And it's, it's, it's not just the individuals that you select to go onto that bus, but it's the team that you put together and their different perspectives. And it's really about interprofessional uh, work. It's about getting disciplines coming together that maybe didn't work together uh, before. I, I see a very only one minute, but you know the importance of who you get on that journey is is critical and important. And it's not just them building interdisciplinary teams, it's building partnerships beyond the walls of your own organization because it will require a full uh, continuum in order to deliver that. I had some other uh, quick points here, inspire and motivate. I don't think there's ever been a time where we work in an ambiguous situation. You know, when, when I was told I'm the executive sponsor for HealthLinks, I said, oh yeah, okay, wow, that's great, but what is it and how do we even get started and how do we start defining what we need to do to change the trajectory of the 5% of patients who consume 60% of our healthcare resources? And if we could focus just on that 5% and change their world and their trajectory, what difference could that make to our capacity? So it is really about finding clarity and ambiguity, it's putting the right people together, it's continually motivating and saying, okay, you didn't quite make that target, but what have we done that's that's really inspirational and allows us to keep the motivation and the enthusiasm to keep going forward. And then it's around connecting the other dots, uh, and my time is up, but connecting the dots to other initiatives is so important. So thank you very much. Well, you guys, your slides are next, even though we're next on the program. Do you want to jump up? I still work at Grand River. (laughs) (laughs) Great. So again, I'm Clint Attendido. I'm the Program Director for Emergency Access and Flow in the Ambulatory Clinics. And uh, my colleague, Barb Stiedese, uh, was our executive uh, sponsor for improving flow from the ED to the inpatient units. So um, we're no different than many other organizations in the province which is challenged by flow. And when we took this project on, um, we, we realized that there was a lot of metrics that we weren't achieving, our pay for result metrics, our quit metrics. And um, most importantly, our patients weren't satisfied because we had long stays in the emergency department. And, and the other factor was that staff was very dissatisfied with, with the amount of work they had to do to facilitate transfers to inpatient units late in the day. So we thought we could do something about this and we hypothesized that it's not about having more discharges but distributing the work throughout the day. Uh, When we analyzed the data, 10% of the patients that go home in our organization were leaving at 11 o'clock, another 30% at around two, but then the majority of patients were leaving at at five o'clock. And and like most organizations, we we know that our resources aren't there, DI, lab, uh, portering, housekeeping. So we were quite challenged to sort of look at how we can sort of evenly distribute the work. So our aim was to improve the distribution of discharges that occur throughout the day by increasing the percentage of medical patients specifically who are discharged from hospital by 11 o'clock from 13% to 30% by September of, of this year. 
So our outcome measures were the number of patients discharged at 11 o'clock on the medical unit. However, that's expanded to include our surgical unit, and then we looked at it uh, as a corporate measure as well. And then the sort of outcome measure was looking at our length of stay for admitted patients in our emergency department, but also time to inpatient that as well. Our process measures were the percentage of bullet rounds on the medical unit that follow a standard process. We've been doing bullet rounds in our organization for some time, but every unit was doing it different ways. Uh, the number of physicians who attended bullet rounds. Um, our, our bed meeting is at 10 o'clock, and we found it a challenge for our physicians to sort of um, attend to the units in a timely manner, and, and most often times um, the, the nursing units were having these bullet rounds without the physician involved. Um, the number of nurses who use a standardized bullet round checklist to give an update at rounds, and the number of patients who are moved from red to yellow uh, discharge status to green status during bullet rounds. So we have this sort of uh, color system that dictates sort of what, what the status is of our patients, yellow being um, within 72 uh, hours, green being that day and red if, it, if the patient happens to be in hospital for greater than 72 hours. And then our balancing measure was patient satisfaction related to our discharge processes. And we also looked at our readmission rate within 48 hours because it was a notion that if we discharge patients sooner that they'd come back to hospital um, you know, uh, within 48 hours or within seven days. And so that was a measure that we had to keep particular uh, focus on. So what were our, our big changes? So we did lots of sort of um, process improvements, lean work, and one of the key things was looking at our standardized bullet rounds. So like I said uh, earlier, every unit was doing it differently, but we never asked the physicians, what do you want to hear at bullet rounds? Right? So we engaged them, and they basically said, just tell us what the barriers to care is, what are sort of, what's their status, and then how can we help to facilitate sort of the process? So our surgical units happened to be doing that very well, so we did some cross-training. So we brought our medical charge nurses, um, to, those, to, to the surgical department to observe how bullet rounds were being done. We looked at implementing quality crosses. So this, there's, like I said, numerous work that's been done to improve flow, but we also um, took on initiatives like EDPIP, uh, Theta Care, releasing time to care, and there were many tools that we thought that we could still use and sort of revitalize with the team, and quality crosses were it. So we wanted to make this as visual as possible and, as tra and transparent as possible to the team. So at our bed meetings, we put these quality crosses up. So every time we achieved an 11 o'clock discharge with a metric of 30%, we shared that and we celebrated it. So they, they could see, oh, we're trending poorly and we're, we're, we've been red for the last three days, or in fact, we've been green for you know a week, and you know what are we doing to, or what can we do to sort of uh, continue our success? And then the last thing was implementing a, a flow steering committee. We've never had this before in our organization, and we needed a committee to keep an eye on sort of like all the work that was being done. The timing for the IDEAS uh, project was key because we, we sort of started our cohort in early February or late February, but at that time we were just in the process of our developing our QIP and putting our pay for result strategy in place. And through the IDEAS program, we looked at all that and we, um, we basically realigned all our work. And it, to keep an eye on that, we implemented a flow steering committee with all the right key stakeholders to make sure that our flow initiatives through the IDEAS project were being implemented in a timely manner. So this is sort of our results prior to um, implementing, uh, you know, a lot of our change initiatives. And as you can see, we were well below the 10 percent. And, you know, we had to sort of frame this to our physicians and to our staff. When they when they said 30 percent, how are we going to ever achieve that? We we basically said, well, we have four medical units in in our hospital. If we discharge one patient by 11 o'clock, at least one patient on each unit, we could probably achieve our 30%. And really, that for us, that worked out to be about four to six patients before 11. Um, we uh, implemented a value stream uh, analysis, and through that, we came up with three lean events in eMERGE and one uh, that partnered with medicine to look at our change improvements. Um, we imp implemented a transitional bed unit, and through pay for results, we were able to add resources, not only just in Emerge, but corporately through the organization to, to impact our flow. And this is our work to date. So we were able to sort of um, sustain some of that work, realizing though that um, our volumes have increased uh, probably since August. We've seen an increase in our volumes uh, of 10%. We've recently moved uh, to a new wing in our organization, and that's created some flow challenges, because geographically, uh, prior to this, we've, we sort of looked at the workflow with our physicians and how they um, did their rounds and did their work, and so that's changed, so we have to sort of relook at that process again. But we've been able to, um, like I said, 
sustain it for the most part. We're back on the, at the drawing board again to look at what else we could be, uh, be doing to sort of get that metric back up because we're down to 20% right now. So we, we did meet um, at 30% discharge. We are challenged with flows and our ALC numbers are going up, so we were looking for other strategies. Um, more physicians did attend the bullet rounds, but now because of our geographic space, they're now challenged to, to attend bullet rounds in a timely manner. Uh, patient experience we looked at, so we did just-in-time surveys in our emergency department to ensure that patients were satisfied that they weren't sort of having um, to wait longer in ED, and we were seeing that we were seeing improvements there. Um, as we were getting more discharges, we, we came up with a strategy to implement transitional bed units, so that came out of the IDEAS program too. So when they were identified to go up to the floor, we moved them out to the ED while they waited for their inpatient bed. And then as a result to date, we um, have seen that based on our improvements with our pay for result metrics, um, we, we should hope to get some additional funding next year, so that was exciting. And through improving our flow processes, we did see a, a, a decrease in our conservable bed days by um, half a day on our medical side. Um, so one of the big achievements was that we did decrease length of stay. So we were at 46 hours initially, and within five months of the project, we, we dropped that down to 30 hours. Um, we, like I said, it's really important to celebrate the successes at, at, you know, at bed meeting. And um, we did look at our DI processes, because one of the barriers to care or access was timeliness of our, our uh, diagnostic imaging. So we did create an algorithm, put a priority sort of uh, um, matrix in place to say that if a patient was identified as ready to be discharged that day, that DI would um, prioritize their tests and so that we can uh, get them discharged in a timely manner. Um, so the overall challenges was that we have comp uh, competing priorities. So fortunately, we put this committee in place, that flow committee, to uh, keep those priorities uh, front and center. Um, predicting date of discharge is often a challenge, and so our physicians need to be engaged with communicating that better uh, with the team and with the families. And then sustainability is always a case. So as you saw, we, we achieved initial gains, and now we're sort of on the slip. And so what do we need to do differently to pick us back up again? Um, our executive sponsor was great, and I'll, I'll invite Barb up shortly, uh, but basically they were the, f the voice for the team. They were uh, present at our bed meetings. Um, uh, they advocated with senior team to get paid for result funding like spread corporately. Um, and then they, they also mentored us. You know, like They have a lot of experience with quality improvement, so our team was mentored by her to sort of, you know, in ways that we can deliver um, our successes with the team and, and ways we can improve. So our next step is, you know, basically looking at our discharge process. There's, there was a ton of work that, that needed to be done, but uh, using the tools um, through ideas, so one specifically was a driver diagram. We, like I said, we aligned that with our QIP and our pay for results, but then we also looked at all the work that was being done and said, do we need to do this now? Is that part of our driver diagram? If not, then let's refocus and, and uh, sort of redirect. Um, and then some of the other stuff that we're doing, standardized uh, discharge checklists, uh, uh, patient summaries, uh, pamphlets for transfers of care, and discharge instructions. So I'll invite Barb up for a reflection. Thanks, Clint. So I'm lucky. I joined the organization in July. This project was being highly successful, and I was the executive sponsor. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> However, we all know in healthcare the, the biggest challenge is the sustainability. And sometimes we're like a tight hockey team. The puck goes into the left corner, and we all run after it because it's exciting. And we're all trying to get to the puck and make it work and get that goal. Later, which is now, the puck's gone to the right corner. It's another idea, and we all want to run and chase that puck. And here's this project sitting in the left corner with no one uh, skating after it. So we've now's the time to become a different type of team and try and sustain. So what we've learned from that, um, we probably should have engaged the physicians earlier in the process uh, and even had them on the ideas team. So our next cohort, which we're in right now, we've got a couple of physicians on the team, which uh, we learned from this one. Um, look at the project scope and ensure the stakeholders are the right ones. So the toughest place to get an 11 a.m. discharge is the medicine program. We didn't have someone on the team from the medicine program. Clint, Loretta, and Sandy are absolute stars, but they have their day jobs to go back to. And so we needed, probably should have had someone on the team from the medicine program. Uh, my role, to be present where it matters, that front lines see that I'm engaged and that that goal matters to me. So being at Flow Steering Committee and promoting it at that, the results at that level, come to bed meeting when I can, 
and uh, you know ask about the 11 a.m. discharge. Finally, accountability. We need someone who's accountable for it going forward uh, to keep it sustained. So we need to now be like a bantam hockey team where we spread out. We've all got, we're all part of the team to get that next goal. I would have said midget, but that meant we would be beating each other up. <laughs> so uh, that's where we are today. Okay, so we are from Grand River Hospital. Our project, um, Lynn Julius was the executive sponsor. We also had um, a cross Lynn kind of experience where we worked with Guelph General as well as part of our team, Dr. Ian Digby and a frontline staff nurse and Emerge, um, Lisa Pell, and our director of Emerge, Karen Bell, was also on our team. Our goal and our aim statement when we came into the ideas program well just as Clint said we came in thinking you know we're gonna uh, just constructing the aim statement was difficult but we managed to find that we wanted to, what our focus was to look at the patient in the process of when they present to the emergency department and to focus specifically on that door to provider time when the patient feels that they that nothing's kind of happening yet is usually there's a lot of things happening but they don't know that so our goal was to actually increase the patient satisfaction rate that was running around 83% to 90% by June 2014. So that gave us a very short timeline to do it, but we were really lucky with the ideas pro program that we got a lot of the tools that we needed to actually be able to meet our goals. Um, the other piece um, that was important to why we did this project was that in the, emer in the emergency world, you don't get a lot of data that is quick and relevant. We, the NCR NRC picker, is, seven, is sent out 70 days after the patients leave. And that's too long to kind of look at what happened and maybe what went down that day. So we did develop our own um, patient satisfaction tool that we used every day and we looked at the results every day to monitor our goals. The change methods that we chose from the toolbox of the ideas um, kind of focused on the communication aspect. We looked at um, applying the tools from the program to measure, but what we really wanted to do was to look at how can we change that patient's experience. So what we did was we actually sort of standardized the communication that all of the nurses, our volunteers, um, used when patients presented to the eMERGE. We used uh, AIDIT philosophy, which probably a lot of you have heard about, which is um, where you acknowledge the patient, you introduce yourself, you explain a bit about the duration and what they're going to experience while they're there and you thank them. And it doesn't mean thanks for coming to the eMERGE and adding to our volumes. <laughs> it means, you know, thank you very much for listening or thank you for being patient. But making them feel valued so that they have a good experience because no one chooses usually to come to the eMERGE. We did um, a lot of different um, PDSA cycles um, so we could measure the changes and actually act on the changes that we saw. We did involve the patient right at the beginning. We had focus groups. Um, we had focus groups of people who were unsatisfied with their, stay, with their experience and we had focus groups of patients who were satisfied or we thought they might be satisfied because we had actually implemented the change so we wanted to see if there was a difference. Uh, we did, had a lot of different families of measures um, that we used. The biggest was to look at the uh, percentage of patient satisfaction rate and the change in that. Um, and the staff satisfaction was very important because we were asking the nurses to work in a standard way. They were all good at communicating with the patients. However, um, the, we wanted them to do it in a certain way so that we could actually measure the tool. Uh, we had a lot of different process applications and then balancing measures. We hoped that we would see some changes in those, but they weren't our main focus. Some of our results that we saw, um, they actually it did look like that we had an effect. Our length of stay of our CTAS level uh, one to three patients actually went down when we implemented um, AIDIT and it implemented at the same time as we did a, another change process that we were doing but we did see some changes. We saw changes and improvement in our 
PIA time, which was a balancing measure and not really one of our main focuses, but it's good if you can see changes across all the parameters. Our left without being seen rate um, started to drop and stabilize. And now it's um, in, we're still monitoring these metrics and are now our left without being seen rate is running around 3% which um, still, we can always do that. We, we have days that we see zero left without being seen patients because we know we want to deliver quality care. And if the patient doesn't stay for their care, then we have missed our mark. The patient experience, we did hit that mark. We managed to actually hit 100% patient satisfaction um, in uh, the summer, and it's trending right up there in the high 90s to 100% just because the patient knows what they're waiting for now. They know, and they might not even be waiting. They might just be, uh, you know, they've had a test, the nurse is communicating how long it's gonna be for their test to come back, and it's improved the patient's experience. Our patient survey tool, I just added it here so you guys could see it. And we also implemented a wait time clock at the, also, and that was, the purpose behind that was to actually give the nurses the tool to actually explain some of the duration. And also it's a, it's a web-based, so the patients can actually view the wait time clock if they want prior to actually coming to the emergency department. They might want to choose a different avenue for their care, but if they want to come, we welcome them and we want to make their experience uh, a good and consistent. The patient focus groups that we did do, the, this is uh, the after group, who after we implemented AIDIT, these are the words that they said. We used the emotional mapping technique that was presented in the ideas um, program, and it was very valuable. The previous um, Wordle, which I didn't bring, put in this presentation, had a lot of unhappy words like long wait, cold, you know, angry, frustrated. So to see the change was very valuable, and to have the patients actually presenting this to us was very, uh, how, really great, I have to say. I mean, we're going to keep them involved in our group. So the um, challenges that we saw uh, were really about attracting the stakeholders in the beginning and getting that initial engagement. We found it more difficult than we thought to actually get a focus group together. So people loved to phone me and complain, but they didn't want to come and tell me in person. So that was challenging. Um, but once we did get going, it was quite good. Um, the data, the data is important. You need to trend your data and you need to use the tools that we learned in the ideas in order to continue to look for those special causes and actually be able to uh, act on them and act on them early. Um, it was a cross-organizational project and at times that was challenging. It also means that our fit at Grand River might not be the exact fit for Guelph. They might have to change it a little bit. Um, some of the learnings we had were to um, continue with the patient focus groups. We're going to actually have um, some of the patients attend our quality councils. We continue to have the um, tools and we talk about just this one tool, aid it, every day in all of our meetings, in our quality councils. The data piece, we also um, are looking for a better solution because right now a lot of it was driven by you know manual counting of the scores but we also had a smartphone technology there so we could map it out in Excel and once again the um, cross organizational project it's really key to work with your partners in the LIN and to actually build something that you can share across this, uh, the organizations so our overall learnings is ideas is a great thing and everyone needs to do it. We need to speak <laughs> the same language, we need to work together, and we need to network and share. I'm gonna invite Lynn um, to speak now about her executive sponsor. Okay, there we go. Um, opportunity to improve the ED and the outcome was um, in the pay for results indicators was really affected by this project. Um, the methodology and, and outcomes can support other programs and projects that are currently happening at Grand River. Um, planning and performance actually was, was also involved in patient experience and they continue to do some research so we're, we're um, backing each other up in that zone. Uh, ED Operations Improvement Committee which had been uh, a structure put in place 
about two and a half years before that, really supported it and was really kind of the cheerleader every bi uh, on our biweekly meetings. Um, some of the things that came first, we've talked about NRC Picker, how we felt that we needed to move beyond that. Um, the overcapacity protocol, which is our bed utilization and um, um, overcapacity of uh, requirements where it was, came first. And that actually started the culture of some change of rather than ED owning the patient, but the inpatient units pulling the patient because that medicine patient belongs on that medicine unit, not waiting in the ED. We collaborated with not only Guelph uh, in the Ideas Project, but also St. Mary's with their Oculus and the wait times clock. Uh, the waiting room was, uh, was in desperate need of some um, changes, so that happened as well as a result, supported the patient experience. Leadership support as the AVP, I think we've talked about how that uh, senior individual supports all of these programs. Uh, patient satisfaction is an uh, indicator on our squal quality scorecard, so it was right in line. It was a vehicle for credibility within the organization and uh, contributed to overall quality. And at the time, the ED was rather beat up spot um, in the news quite frequently, and so we really welcomed this new perspective and, and support. Jill and Karen created a schedule for ideas that uh, was um, project management in that it moved along right as it was supposed to and I think that was one of the reasons why you really saw the the results as soon as you did um, the EDOC was uh, prized and as Jill talked about the chats were um, excellent way for that aid it tool to be shared with the rest of the staff uh, my role changed so my role as a support changed a little bit um, the, the general ability to clinical spread was, was an excellent one, and we have seen some of that. Uh, competing priorities meant that Jill and Karen were working long hours to the end of the days and then beyond that, and, and uh, that's a testament to their dedication. Um, it has significantly supported the planning of other patient experience surveys, ideas, experience models, the way for managing clinical projects at Grand River, and we will use this, this model in, our, in other areas. And ultimately, the staff were very proud of the outcome and the strategies that were used. So I uh, applaud them because while I, I was an executive sponsor, truly, it, uh, it, it's really their work and the staff and the ED and that culture shift has been excellent. Thank you. So we've deliberately um, designed this session to give us a period of time that we can sort of have a question and answers uh, with the teams here and the executive sponsors to sort of drill down on this. Three different projects, um, uh, three different environments, uh, but some very common uh, themes here. And I, I want to I start by drawing out one of the um, interesting and challenging aspects of doing this kind of quality improvement, and that is that in order to change these complex systems, you really need to focus on specific elements. Trying to change the whole system is very, very difficult, but trying to figure out where to intervene, what the specific changes are that might start to move the system in the right direction. And you notice the changes are gradual, right? They're, we're hitting singles here. We're not hitting home runs. We're not redesigning whole facilities. We're trying to get people to work together and understand their work more effectively and use that knowledge to make a difference. So my first question for these teams is really, tell us how you've described the project now and the, and the work that you did in that project. How did that project inform other work that's going on now what what learning did you bring from that that helped you to focus on what needed to happen next? So, Amir, let me start with you. These are on. Okay, these are on. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, good question. Um, so the the work is ongoing, and I think uh, participating in a program like this, where you actually have to use the learnings in real time, dedicated to improvement work on the go uh, solidifies it for you so that the next time you're back on the bus, whether it's the same project or whether uh, it's offshoots of that project or something completely different, those tools are right there. Like I remember um, Patty asking us, what was the tool that you guys liked most uh, that really advanced things for you? And for us, I guess my answer, I remember that steering committee meeting was uh, the NHS's sustainability uh, tool where it told us that we should cease and desist right now. We have no hope. Uh, our, project, <laughs> our project will die. It won't be, you know, we, we won't be able to scale and spread it. Um, but you know, 
you're then able to take that into your next project and say, look, do we have the right elements here? Uh, can we apply the same tools? Do we have to do things differently? It's, it's additive. Uh, so it's a, a very valuable experience. Not sure I answered the question. Um, Patty, anyone else here from the panel have comments? Let's, let's, why don't we move across the teams, then we'll come back for an executive sponsor sure. sort of view on this. Um, for us, uh, it was, there was a big focus in the ideas program about data. And so looking at our current data set and try to understand it, and not only that, but making it very transparent to the frontline team so that they understand at their level what that means corporately and, um, and related to the projects that we were doing. So um, we had to sort of dumb it down in a sense and then be very, very transparent about all the tools we were reporting at so that they understood behind the scenes why we're doing what we were doing. Um, and then this, this, uh, probably the most effective tool that we utilize and we still utilize today is a Pareto diagram, right? So understanding root cause. So every day at bed meeting, they would come and say, you know, here are possible discharges, but they never provided a reason why. So for a month and a couple times after that, we started documenting, okay, tell us what those barriers to discharge are. And from that, we looked at our 80% and it was physicians not being at, at rounds, uh, delays in DI in lab. And then we went back and looked at our processes again and that whole uh, PDSA piece that we, we learned that the ideas would reapply to then, you know, drill down at those root causes and then find some solutions to improve it again. Yeah. So. Thanks. And I think um, at Grand River, what we found was, again, s similar to Clint with regard to data. The need for data is huge in order to be able to track and look at what to do next. So I mean that we, at our course, we had a, access to a book and a, there was a speaker Lloyd uh, Provost, I think his last name, he brought this great Bible of data in healthcare mm -hmm. that we have bought now as gifts for a lot of people in our organization <laughs> of please read this book. We're, uh, we want to do this and we want to do it together. We've also been successful in getting um, our own actual decision support person just to work on our own eMERGE team so that we can continue to use and grow and change the way the patients experience care in our department and then we've grown it into our quality um, team as well. We have a quality team in our organization and they are work with us every day on different pro um, projects and just that is a win for everybody. So I think that's key. Good, let me, let me ask the same question but from an executive sponsor sort of point of view. So you all have had the experience of having teams go off to ideas to come back with new tools and new ideas and new projects. But you have strategic responsibilities to move this agenda forward in the organization. What have you learned about linking the ideas teams and the ideas uh, tools into the broader agenda in, in the emergency department or working with these complex patients in the health link? Uh, I have a new role and it's kind of looking at a thousand feet to build some capacity and so I think some of the um, ideas framework and it's the framework and the approach and the design of how you approach a complex problem for a solution. So applying that same framework to other problems that are very ambiguous in nature and being able to drill down to root cause. Um, the impact of socioeconomic status of our patients in our community and, and hospital utilization was profound and some of the learnings that we had I think through Health Links has opened up a totally new dimension of what are the main issues of recurring patients that, that repeatedly come through the emergency department. We're now applying a very similar framework to a med psych alliance, so the medical, the intersection of medical conditions with mental health conditions, and then trying to move that forward in a very different way. And it's a very new area of interest, I would say. It's complex. It feels start, like we started over with health links. You know, we knew, understood a little bit of the issues and the challenges, but trying to understand it across the spectrum beyond the walls of the hospital and then being able to build partnerships throughout the whole continuum of care requires a framework and a thinking and uh, I think the ideas program gave us that foundation in which to build another initiative very similar but uh, again using the same strategies. Great. So I think similarly th when you're trying to implement a strategy it, it can't be implemented or achieved without operationalizing what it is you're trying to achieve. So taking the building blocks of ideas and using that same strategy or process as you build on all of those operational changes to achieve the strategy instead of jumping around trying this, 
you know, ideas for this one and then trying something completely different for something else. It's trying to stay focused and get everyone on board uh, using those tools and understanding how you're getting there in terms of process. Mm -hmm. yeah, good, thanks. Lynn? Um, at Grand River, patient experience is on our um, uh, strategic plan and in the quip, and so it wasn't difficult to say that framework can now be translated into an, in another area in the hospital. And certainly, um, that culture shift from from a nursing perspective to be very prescriptive on on that approach to the patient can. Um, work in any any area of the hospital we have and it's free right yeah, it's, free. Uh, it's not a it's not it's not uh, um, a computer software piece that we have to implement somewhere it's it's actually probably why many uh, of us went into nursing in the first place and I think maybe we've got off the track of what it was that we were supposed to be doing when we first are introduced to a patient and what our accountability is. So that values piece uh, for me is very, very important. And some of the other projects that are currently ongoing, such as transfer of accountability, bring that, that flavor of what are we talking to the patients about and what are their expectations and how can we meet it. So I think it's really the tip of the iceberg for the rest of our organization and how we actually um, interact in a in a very respectful way with with our patients so Great. we're really happy about it good thank you so let me open this up uh, as you can see we've deliberately uh, created a panel which includes people who had the frontline focus of ideas but also the link to the executive sponsorship because we think both those pieces are critical to making these changes happen and sustaining them within organizations what questions do you have for these teams about their experience and the tools and information that they brought back to their facilities. Yes. Hi, so I'm actually from the public health sector and I have to say I was very pleased to hear reference to the social determinants of health because one of the things that I think in, in all our quality improvement work and thinking about our outcomes is there's a huge piece of our outcomes that are outside the control of health. We're not funded to do that. It's, you know, it's conditions in which people live. So I wondered about, if you take that back to your ideas project, how you scoped out your project to really limit it to the pieces that you were in control of. So even in the eMERGE, you're in control of pieces of it, but there are other parts of, say, the hospital system or follow-up discharge or whatever that you're not actually in control of. So how did you sort of really scope your projects in that frame? Okay, everyone's looking at me. I guess I'll take a <laughs> first crack at this one. Um, these are big, complex problems with no tailor-made solutions. And so the scoping, I think you, you heard in each of these project presentations, there was a wider goal. And what we were able to carve out in a four-month uh, learning and doing program was a small piece of that overall goal. And even in our project, when I presented um, you know, those are goals that are beyond the life of the initial four months, and those are results beyond the initial four months. You're right, it's easy to try to scope down to things within your control, but some of these larger cross-sectoral issues, uh, where there are no easy solutions because we would have done them before, um, it requires a leap and uh, strong partnerships, and that's where we turn to our executive sponsors to help forge those ties. Okay, so I'm just going to break <coughs> But it's actually, I don't think it's easy to scope them out to what's in your control. I think part of it is we often scope too big. And that's what I wondered is, like, how did you bring the team back to just focus on that piece? Uh, so Given we, that we, we realized. I, I would say we had excellent coaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we had uh, coaches from Health Quality Ontario. And even within teams, we had a wealth of experience to say <laughs> what is doable, what is not. And you know, when you have a looming four month deadline and every month you're coming uh, to another session where you have to give a report back, you have to put another presentation together, people are gonna ask you questions about what you did, and you're learning new tools and you have to go out there and implement them, there's a very tight timeline. So that question, I think we probably spent a good month on zeroing that question into a sizable chunk. So for the um, emergency department, um, 
we wanted to boil the ocean, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, when we came to the ideas program, we had numerous goals. And then on day one or that weekend, the team really helped narrow it down. And so it, it, it was how they framed it. So they, to your point, like what can you control and what can't you control? And from our point of view, we looked at what we can't control, but then how it would impact the ED. So I can't control um, throughput into the inpatient unit. But we knew that if we focused on that particular issue, that our metrics would improve for ED length of stay and time to inpatient bed. And so that's how we, we did it. And, and it, that wasn't part of our initial sort of um, project goal when we first came to Ideas. And I think that evolved through sort of the coaching that we got through the, through the team with Ideas. Yeah. And I think from our perspective, it's the same. It was the key, and Joe, our coach, kept saying, Take small bites of the elephant. Don't eat the whole elephant at once. So making sure our aim statement was something that we could achieve and that we could demonstrate because part of the sustainability piece is be able to take back to your stakeholders and show them that what you're asking them to do is actually working and be able to share that success with them so that you can keep moving down the road. Um, and the thing is that when you start small, you recognize there's you know a thousand other projects that you could actually do but to do them all at once or to do them in a, as Clint said, uh, boiling the ocean, you're not going to get any traction. So I think you really have to really pull it back, get a project plan together and start chipping away because there's lots of different things we can do. And the other great thing about ideas is to be able to share the knowledge and share the successes and hear from other teams read their posters, see their presentations. You can learn something from everyone, and that was key. Yeah, thank you. And I think, I mean, the, the paradox of quality improvement is that there are big, hairy system issues out there, and these are very small, very limited projects, right? So that's the paradox, but we, the, the underlying strategy is to use the small project to learn about the system to figure out what the other leverage points are. And as you heard in each one of these cases, now a clear understanding of where else we need to go. And some of it is big system, executive sponsor responsibility, and some of it is more of this frontline engagement, helping people to recognize that they can actually change the work that they're involved in, which is a huge breakthrough in, in, many, in many environments. I'm going to move to the other microphone here, please. Hi, I'm Laura Visser. I'm with the Provincial Council for Maternal and Child Health. My question, I think, starts with Patty, but it, others may want to contribute. The question is around executive sponsorship, and I think it's a critical role. And what, whether you have any transferable lessons learned or advice around that executive sponsorship role when the, the change initiative is cross-sectoral, relative to being an executive sponsor for initiative within an organization where you have an established leadership position with the, the team members? You know, it's an excellent question. And, and I was saying, you know, the challenges of today are going to be different from tomorrow. And that's exactly what we're facing now um, as part of the challenges of learning to work differently between organizations and with organizations and selecting how to how to connect and build those relationships in a very different way so it's a it's a different skill set and um, and I know I see people here in the audience from CCAC and you know we built health links with those partnerships in mind we're building them uh, in other areas of well as well and just to the the former question part of the role of the executive sponsor is to listen to what are the big issues that are getting in the way and and then de developing that and building that into a different clinical strategy at a very different level and so working with our Lynn partners on supportive housing for instance because all of a sudden we realize that that it is important in, in utilization so I, I don't know that I answered your question I think it's a it's an area of maybe ideas can take that forward in, as a skill set in development but um, it's a very different way of, of working and it's it's going to be very important uh, when we look to solutions for tomorrow so thanks for the question Barbara Lynn you want to Pick that on. Well, I was just, Go just going to add that having someone from a different sector at the table at the ideas program is probably the, if you can manage it, one of the best ways to engage them in also supporting right. the project. Right. So our next, our next cohort um, 
I know it's the same sector, but involves family health team or the primary care, which often is almost a different sector sometimes. And so we've got them on our ideas team the next time so that we know if we want to make that link work, we've got them at the table and they understand the processes as well. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Go to, back to this microphone, please. Uh, good morning. Yes. Um, first of all, I have two questions. The first question relates to logistics. When I uh, registered for HQ or this transformation um, conference, I was torn because there are so many excellent uh, <laughs> uh, initiatives being discussed uh, today. So I guess my first question, um, Dr. Baker, is will the presentations that are being uh, given today be uh, available online for all uh, participants to access? The answer to that is yes. I'm just looking at our uh, HQO colleagues here. So I had the same problem because I'm here. And, and, <laughs> and, and I wanted to be somewhere else at the same time. So, yeah. Uh, and secondly, the, my second question, uh, Quint, uh, Clint, you were saying that um, you were talking about the, uh, the quality crosses. And I'm a little bit unfamiliar with that um, um, prospect. If, if you could uh, provide more sure. detail. So that's um, part, of, uh, part of, I guess, the Release of Time to Care project. Um, it basically is a calendar that's, that looks like a cross. And so if you achieve whatever goal you set, it's green. If you are within a certain percentage of that goal, it's yellow. And then if you don't meet it, it's red. And so it's just a visual sort of tool to show uh, the team trends. And so what we've done is we basically posted it like in our um, where we do, do our bed meetings and so they can see month over month like our, our first month was pre pretty much red and then as time improved every month we got more greens less yellows and then to a point where over 70 percent of the time we were achieving green so just visually looking instead of a graph or whatever uh, for the team who you know the charge nurses the nurses that were just involved or the allied health teams Ordering, whoever was at our meetings, they could see what was going on and very simplistically identify that, yeah, we're seeing improvements. So, um, was that an electronic cross? Nope, very manual. So, crayon. we, yeah, crayon <laughs> marker. So, everything is, we, we, was very basic. So, we have, we have an electronic daily um, access reporting to our DART, which shows our metrics. Our patient flow coordinator or manager then, you know, looks at that every day and then takes the results and, and colors the, the, basically the calendar and shows whether or not we've met the metric or not. And the first thing in, in, at bed meeting, she says, today we're green. We met our target. We had four discharges in medicine, six on surgery, and corporately we're yellow because when we, then we look at the sum of our discharges and whether or not we achieved it as a whole. So we review our metrics every day and then every week we, have a, we, we sort of report out on how we did the week before because we don't have that sort of timeliness with our data. But when we sort of reflect back and say, what do we do that week that we could do better this week? Good, thank you. Let's move to this microphone. Hi, uh, I'm from the OHMTS, Daniel. Um, I have a question concerning building a Laura's question on the executive leadership, and also ask uh, maybe a very pertinent question to the patient experience. Uh, in my thesis, I actually looked at the emergency department satisfaction, and, and one of the big drivers for it was actually physician courtesy. So uh, I wanted to ask this question in terms of leadership. I noticed the leadership model is really where you have a vice president of a hospital. I'm wondering, and also heard a lot of you know discussion of partnership. Is there an opportunity in your model to actually have a shared partnership with a clinical, being the MAC or a physician lead, with an administrator of a hospital that maybe en enables that part of the house? And also, I heard through the discussion one of the I think it was Markham said that one of the lessons learned is actually involving the physician earlier on. So. That's why I was prompting my question. Maybe there's uh, an opportunity to have a shared model for leadership that could embrace this. So I think you're, abs <coughs> you're absolutely right. So engaging, so firmly believe in engaging the physicians if you want to change or move or improve physician care or approach uh, to the process, to having a physician lead or an ex the physician could be the executive sponsor standing alone um, without the administrative person. Uh, but probably it would be helpful to have some help in that area uh, if they're not familiar with doing that. But we have two physicians on our next team, uh, both one from primary care and one from the medicine unit. So we will be able to tell you next time how successful that was. But they're highly engaged at this point. So, 
Um, at, at Grand River, we have it at the ED Operations Improvement Committee, which has senior leadership um, as the, the um, VP of Medicine um, uh, Affairs, as well as our uh, Chief of Staff is on that committee, as, as including in uh, the ED Medical Director. So there was quite an array of support as this was reported uh, on a biweekly basis. <clears throat> we haven't got a next project yet uh, formed with ideas. It's something that we're considering for the next uh, intake, but um, absolutely, if you don't have that frontline leadership, and we had this triumvirate of medical director Jill and Karen as a, as a program director that were joined at the hip, and so while uh, uh, Dr. Wickett wasn't necessarily involved in this. He was right on the edge in the periphery. So I think now we can move in that direction in terms of implementation of what does it look like with the physician at the bedside. Good question. Hi, I have uh, both a question and a comment, and I'm and it's for both the ideas uh, program and and those of you who have been um, using their methodology. Have any of you thought about? Um, making sure that patients and their caregivers are engaged in every uh, part of those improvement initiatives. The reason I ask the question is that um, I've actually had the privilege of working um, in the Northumberland Path Project over the last couple of years where we've done things very differently. And the patients and their caregivers, and we have a community partnership, but the patients and their caregivers have been working together with us as equal partners, um, helping us to understand what the issues are, are from their perspective, then working together with us and all of our project teams to come up with the solutions, and actually then working with us to evaluate um, what those solutions were. And it's changed all of us in such a dramatic way in the way that we look at quality improvement and I think that's something we have to move towards in the future so just wondering whether from whether there's going to be any criteria in the future from the ideas program that when you get your teams together that has to include uh, consumers of whatever the project is um, and, um, and, and and to any of you uh, whether you have given that any thought or uh, for the future so just say from the point of view of the experience, the learning experience, we definitely have that message about the critical value of, of involving patients. Um, and we we certainly have seen this in, in a number of projects. And uh, I mean, maybe Amir, you'd like to talk about the way in which that happened in, uh, in your project. Sure. So in the ideas curriculum, there is a significant chunk devoted to uh, essentially patient co-design of the system. And uh, I remember, I, I think it's day two or day three, uh, early, fairly early on in the curriculum, um, we're, we're asked about how we've incorporated patients into the design of solutions. And in our project, um, you know, we started with a care plan that was extremely provider-centric. So five pages, starts off in a typical fashion with past medical history, the team members. And when we had patients engage on it, they're like, well, that's actually not who my team is. My team is all these other people that we didn't consider. Um, and what is all this stuff? Why don't we start off with my goals for my care rather than the provider's goals or someone else's assessment of what the goals should be? And that's been very revolutionary for the work that we do. We actually measure our entire success of our health link based on the patient's progress towards their own self-articulated goals and care. Uh, we have a patient on our care plan uh, working group that actually does the work of the health link. So, you know, it's, it's embedded in the curriculum. It's embedded in all the projects that we've designed. Uh, and broader than that, it's the wave of the future. We're not just going from patient-centered design or patient co-design. We're going to patient-driven uh, system improvements. And we need to get on that bus. Thank you for that. Uh, that was great to hear because I think um, we've recognized that patients and their caregivers are an enormous untapped resource that we haven't utilized in our system. And I mean, if we all continue to do that, I think the uh, the changes that we make will actually be changes that will be sustainable because they make us make it sustainable, right? They hold us accountable. Yeah. Well, thank you for. We're ending on a very positive note here on our agreement about the importance of en engaging patients in this work. Thank you all for being here, and give your thanks, please, to the panel, who have really been excellent. So please fill out your evaluations and give us some feedback on this session. Thank you very much.